Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions, and we'll start with question number one from Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is in increasing the legal entitlement to paternity leave and what discussions it's had with the UK Government regarding this. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Whilst employment law remains reserved to the UK Parliament as the responsibility of the UK Government, we are funding the Family Friendly Working Scotland Partnership to promote family friendly and inclusive workplaces to employers and employees in Scotland. The Scottish Government, including its agencies and non ministerial departments, provides eligible employees with up to four weeks consecutive paternity leave at full pay. We would encourage other Scottish employers to work in partnership with their workforce to consider voluntarily offering a similar enhanced paternity leave. Although uh, additional uh, devolved uh, powers uh, in relation to employment would uh, provide the Scottish Parliament with the ability to strengthen employment rates which work for Scotland uh, and with the uh, impact of Brexit still to come, the Scottish Government will publish a discussion paper on that in the next few months. Fulton McGregor. I thank the Minister for that response. A number of studies have, have linked longer paternity leave with a wide range of positive outcomes, including greater maternal well-being, reduced incidence of postnatal depression and fewer behavioural problems in children. Does the Minister agree that employers can benefit from offering enhanced rights in the workplace and would he join me in encouraging employers in Scotland to offer enhanced paternity leave of four weeks? Minister. It, well, it, let me reiterate, yes, I, I would absolutely encourage uh, employers to, uh, to, to do so uh, and, and not uh, just for the reasons that uh, Mr McGregor has set out in terms of uh, child well-being and parental well-being, but we also know that uh, flexible working, uh, whilst it has that clear benefit, for employees, it also has it for employers as well, because if when, they, if when an employer it operates on a, a flexible uh, basis with its workforce, it can end up with a more motivated workforce, reducing absenteeism, increasing better retention rates, uh, and increasing productivity. Uh, so this type of approach uh, is important, not only for, for families, but for the, the Scottish economy uh, as well. And that's why uh, we are, uh, as I mentioned, uh, funding Family Friendly Working uh, Scotland, a, a partnership we participate in. We've provided 850 £7,000 since 2014-15 for that programme and also we're promoting our, our Fair Work agenda on a wider basis. And Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I ask, has the Government done any assessment on what the impact of increased parental leave has on SMEs? Because those are obviously the areas of business that are most likely to suffer from um, employees being absent for periods. Minister. Well, as I've just uh, made the point, actually, what uh, a flexible approach, irrespective of the size of an uh, employer, can, uh, in fact, lead to is uh, reduced absenteeism, better retention rates and increased productivity. And that's what the evidence uh, demonstrates, not just in relation to uh, uh, enhanced paternity leave, but across the board uh, in terms of the flexible work agenda. So actually, SMEs and businesses and employers across Scotland uh, could stand to benefit by adopting that uh, flexible approach. Question number two, Ruth Maguire. To ask the Scottish Government how it's involving stakeholders with the development and implementation of its planning bill. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. The planning bill has been developed through a highly inclusive approach uh, involving extensive engagement and consultation with a wide range of stakeholders. Uh, this has included two formal consultation exercises, convening a series of stakeholder working groups and full publication of regularly updated information on the Scottish Government website. Uh, we have sought out opportunities to engage across our stakeholders throughout the development of the bill and will continue this very inclusive approach as the review of the planning uh, progresses. Ruth Maguire. I thank the Minister for that answer. Our dear peninsula in my constituency is subject to a 1953 order which allows almost any development to be carried out without planning permission. I understand that that could cause issue for potential sustainable development of the site. Would the Minister look into this matter and help find a solution that best meets the needs of our community, promotes inclusive growth as per the aims of the Ayrshire Growth Deal and respects wildlife and the environment? Minister. President Officer, I am aware of the uh, very unusual circumstances surrounding uh, the Special Development Order for our deer. Uh, my officials have been in discussion with North Ayrshire Council officials uh, about the complex planning position there, um, the possible options and how this might best be taken forward uh, to uh, a satisfactory conclusion. I would be very happy to meet with uh, Ms McGuire uh, and stakeholders to discuss the issues and uh, an appropriate uh, way forward for that area. 
Question three has been withdrawn. Question four, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support and encourage young people to engage in sport. Minister Aileen Campbell. Thank you. The Scottish Government strongly encourages people of all ages and backgrounds to try and participate in sport. To aid with this, we have protected Sport Scotland's budget for next year, committed to help mitigate the impact of continued reductions in their income from the National Lottery, invested up to £50 million from our Active Schools programme between 2015-19, and have committed to increase the number of uh, community sports hubs. And, presiding officer, I would also like to use this opportunity to pay tribute to the achievements of Team Scotland during the Gom uh, Gold Coast Commonwealth Games. I'm sure everyone else will agree as well. <laughs> and following the success of Team Scotland, I'm confident that the performances by all of our athletes will inspire young people to take up sport, allowing them to set and achieve their goals. It's Stuart Stevenson. Um, I particularly welcome the fact that a member of the team in Scotland was actually older than me, and that's pretty, uh, pretty unusual. Um, but uh, more seriously, I recently visited uh, Cullen Bowling and Tennis Club, uh, where the members have taken in hand uh, to offer coaching sessions to young people to encourage a new generation of club members. Does the Minister agree that that's an excellent example of community-based approach to encouraging our youngsters to try new sports? Minister. Thank you. Yeah, and I would also like to pay tribute to the athleticism of Stuart Stevenson. Uh, this, this is a great example of encouraging uh, young people to join their club. And I would like to wish uh, Cullen Bowling and Tennis Club every success. Our commitment to Active Schools programme will not only allow children to try new sports, but will also provide them with a pathway to local sports clubs. And I would actively encourage this partnership. And I commend the work in, in Cullen, particularly during this year of young people, for their endeavour uh, to get our young people and children active. Question five, Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many young people, sorry, how many people in the Stirling constituency have received support from the Help to Buy scheme? Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, Help to Buy Scotland data is published at the local authority level uh, and is not readily, readily available by parliamentary constituency. Uh, from October 2013 to March 2017, uh, there have been 190 sales in the Stirling Local Authority area that have received support from the Help to Buy Scotland scheme. Bruce Crawford. I uh, thank the Minister for his reply. I now know I've got to go to the Council in future from that reply, but I'm still grateful that there's been 190 people in my constituents who have benefited. This is a much needed way of supporting people into a new home, particularly those buying their first home. Can you tell me what the age of the range is for this scheme and what the percentage is of first-time homeowners, please, Minister? Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, we estimate that 76% of buyers who purchased the property with assistance through the scheme are aged 35 and under, uh, and 66% have been first-time buyers. Uh, this is based on an analysis of the first three years of the scheme uh, from September 2013 to March 2016. Linda Fabiani. Pres Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I ask the Minister to look at my particular concerns about the open market shared equity scheme? Uh, where there is a, a valuation price set at a threshold and in very desirable areas like East Kilbride, it means that sometimes it's difficult for people to find suitable accommodation to purchase and still get assistance. This is disadvantaging people. It hasn't been looked at for many years now, I understand. Can this consideration be given? Minister. Um, I thank Ms Fabiani for her question and uh, I well understand the desire to live in uh, East Kilbride. Um, the price ceiling um, has gradually reduced from the original figure of £400,000 uh, to the current £200,000 to ensure that more people uh, can benefit from the available funding and help to target funding at lower income families and first time buyers. Uh, we accept that in certain geographical areas, not as many homes will be purchased uh, with assistance from the scheme. Uh, but I can assure uh, Ms Fabiani uh, that I will continue to look at all of this as we progress. Question number six, Lewis MacDonald. Are there plans for major trauma centres in Aberdeen and Dundee to commence in October have been affected by recent events in NHS Tayside? Cabinet Secretary, Jenna Robinson. 
Progress with implementing the Scottish Trauma Network is continuing as planned, including the opening of the major trauma centres in Aberdeen and Dundee in the autumn of this year. Implementation will not be affected by the recent events at NHS Tayside. Lewis MacDonald. I'm pleased to hear that uh, clear assurance from the Cabinet Secretary. I wonder if she can uh, also address the issue of the appointment of Malcolm Wright, the Chief Executive of NHS Grampian, to head up the team uh, rescuing uh, NHS Tayside from its current crisis. Uh, I think when Shona Robson made the announcement, it was as an interim appointment, but in her statement the other day, it was as the new Chief Executive. I wonder if she can clarify uh, the future arrangements for leadership of both NHS Tayside and NHS Grampian. Cabinet Secretary. Do that for uh, Lewis MacDonald. Uh, the Malcolm Wright will also remain as the Chief Executive and Accountable Officer for NHS Grampian. There's no change uh, to that. Uh, I haven't described Malcolm Wright as the interim chief executive. I think he should have the full title as the chief executive of NHS Tayside. But of course, uh, work will be underway very quickly to find a permanent uh, chief executive for NHS uh, Tayside. Uh, and I've also agreed with Professor uh, Stephen Logan, the chair of NHS Grampian, that Amanda Croft who uh, the member will be well aware of as deputy CEO, will oversee the day-to-day -day operations of NHS Grampian. Uh, I think uh, Amanda Croft is very, very capable of doing that, and hopefully that will give the member the assurance that he's seeking. Graham D. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask, in relation to the situation at NHS Tayside, whether the uh, support team led by Professor Lewis Ritchie will continue to provide a, an assurance role on the board's future plans for services? Secretary. Uh, yes, uh, Sir Lewis Ritchie's involvement uh, on the, with the assurance uh, group will continue. Uh, he has provided a very important role there and that continuity uh, is uh, important that that uh, remains and I can certainly make sure that Graham Day is kept uh, informed uh, about that continuing role. Question number seven, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the performance of integrated joint boards since their creation. Cabinet Secretary, Sean Robson. Integration uh, authorities went uh, fully live in April 2016 and are already delivering achievements. Individual integration authorities publish annual reports on how the new arrangements are delivering real change and improvement. The latest annual performance reports are due to be published in July of this year. Liz Smith. Uh, will the Cabinet uh, Secretary confirm to Parliament that uh, she is aware of some of the very strong criticism, including some within her own party, which is being levelled at integrated joint boards because of the current structures are not at all clear in terms of the lines of accountability for decision making and for the accompanying accountability? And will she, with some degree of urgency, review whether the current IGB structure should be completely overhauled? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think the structures are fairly new and I think they should be allowed to uh, bed in. But as everything, we would always keep these matters under review if there are particular concerns that need to be taken forward. Uh, in relation to local matters, I mean, we would expect local partnerships to take forward any changes to services in a way that has the full consultation of the local public. We would expect that to be done in a way that is uh, open and transparent. Uh, if uh, Liz Smith has any particular concerns in relation to that, then I would suggest that she writes to me with the detail. Question number eight, Murdo Fraser. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the Office of the Scottish Charity Regulator regarding the use of public funds by NHS boards. Cabinet Secretary. So at my request, the Chief Executive of NHS Scotland has written to all NHS board chairs seeking assurance that NHS Scotland endowment funds are being used appropriately. Responses are required by the end of April. This approach has been agreed with Oscar and responses will be shared with them. Oscar have agreed to review the evidence provided and once they have considered all of the relevant evidence and completed their risk assessment, they will come to a decision on whether to undertake inquiries into other NHS endowment fund charities. Oscar have indicated to my officials that they plan to be able to give a response on this by the end of May. Murdo Fraser. Thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary for that response. Uh, this morning, the uh, Parliament's Public Audit Committee heard from the Auditor General for Scotland, Caroline Gardner, in relation to this issue. 
Uh, and this raised a number of quite serious questions that require to be uh, addressed, including this question of a conflict of interest that might arise for NHS board members who are being asked to deal with public funds and also deal with funds from uh, uh, charitable endowments. So given that, will the Scottish Government look at creating a structure whereby board members are no longer required to make decisions both on endowment funding and on general funding for NHS boards. Cabinet Secretary. So Fraser may be aware that the guidance uh, around this was reviewed back in 2013. Oscar have already signalled and we've agreed that that guidance should now be reviewed uh, for the very reason that Murdo Fraser uh, points out that there is a potential conflict of interest of board members being the trustees on an endowment fund. Oscar, I think, will come forward with uh, sensible recommendations about what structural changes should be made uh, to that to strengthen uh, the governance, whether that's external people sitting on uh, the endowment fund board as trustees um, or other uh, uh, suggestions that will strengthen that governance. But please be assured, and the members should be assured, that Oscar have already indicated their desire to do that, and we have agreed that that needs to be done. Happy to keep uh, Murdo Fraser and indeed the Chamber updated as that work progresses. Question number nine, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it will protect respite services to allow carers to access a short break as set out by the Carers Scotland Act 2016. Minister Aileen Campbell. Thank you. Under the Carers Act, local authorities now have a duty to provide support to meet carers' identified needs, which meet local eligibility criteria, and to decide whether that support should include a break from caring. The 2018-19 budget includes an additional £66 million to support additional expenditure by local government on social care, including for implementation of the Carers Act. In addition, the Scottish Government is providing £3 million in 2018-19 for the Voluntary Sector Short Breaks Fund, administered by Sharecare Scotland and the Family Fund. Monica Lennon. I thank the Minister for her response and I am pleased that short break support is given prominence in the new carers legislation which came into effect on the 1st of April. However, Lanarkshire Carers Centre have raised with me their concerns that respite services are facing a very uncertain future with many short break providers believing they are at moderate or high risk of local authority funding cuts. At a time when local authorities have seen a real term budget cut of nearly 10% over the last eight years, can the Minister reassure carers and short break providers that sufficient funding will be available for this much needed respite? Minister. We outlined the additional money that we put in to support, um, the, the, to support the additional expenditure by a local government on social care, which includes the implementation of the Carers Act. Uh, I would also point to the fact that at a service planning level, local authorities also have duties now to publish a short break service statement, providing information about short break services available uh, in Scotland so that people can understand what short break options are available. And that's in addition to uh, the, the money that we also provide to the voluntary sector short breaks fund, which I said in my previous answer is administered by Share Care Scotland and the Family Fund. And that's because we, we know how important these short breaks are. We know how important it is to enable uh, carers to have a life alongside their caring role and to enable them to uh, ensure that their well-being uh, is maintained. You know, I'm, again, I'm happy to engage with Monica Lennon on the particular areas or, uh, issues that she's raised around uh, Lannister Carer Centre, but certainly from our perspective, we have put additional resources in to protect and support this important part of this Act. Question number 10, Ash Denham. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the recent publication of large companies' gender pay gaps which show that there remains a significant pay gap among many companies, both in Edinburgh and across the UK. Minister Jimmy Hepburn. Uh, whilst the full-time median gender pay gap in Scotland is lower uh, than the UK uh, figure at 6.6 per cent compared to 9.1 per cent, some of the figures we have seen employers report highlight the very real challenge that remains to uh, be taken to further reduce the gender pay gap. We need to see employers take forward actions which improve the position of, of women in the workplace and wider society. The action we are taking is the establishment of a gender pay gap working group, funding the Turner's programmes which support women following a career break, the establishment of working groups to challenge pregnancy and maternity discrimination and support the delivery of the Women in an Enterprise Action Framework, promoting payment of the living wage and tackling occupational segregation and gender stereotyping through the Modern Apprenticeship Equalities Action Plan and the Scottish, Scottish Funding Council's Gender Action Plan. Ash Denham. I thank the Minister for that answer, but it was particularly disappointing to see that the pay gap in Edinburgh was marginally higher than the national average at 12.9% compared to 
Are there currently any talks between the UK and the Scottish Government regarding further improving the gender pay gap legislation? Minister. Well, if, uh, having mentioned the, the working group on the gender pay gap, one of the uh, early uh, areas of it work will be uh, to work with Close the Gap and Gender in the STUC and other relevant bodies uh, to develop uh, a coherent action plan to reduce uh, gender pay gaps uh, across uh, Scotland. Uh, where uh, we, uh, that may require us making recommendations about legislative change, uh, then we will, of course, uh, seek to engage, uh, recognising that this requires all to make uh, this significant effort, engage with the UK Government to explore uh, options for legislative change and also for joint working on this issue.